Bill, can you hear us? Uh, yes, now I can. Do you want to uh, let Brian know um, to jump out of the teams and try to get into the Zoom? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to get a hold of him. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, it's good to see everybody. It's been a little while. We got a uh, we got yeah. some, we got some stuff to go over. Um, Peter's, Pete's joining us too. Oh, there he is. Okay, cool. Morning, Good morning. Pete. Morning, Pete. Morning. Sorry about that. Were you guys expecting Dan at all? No, Dan unfortunately uh, texted yesterday. He could not make the meeting today. Okay. So we're going to give him an update on Saturday because we have a board of oversight meeting. Um, gotcha. But because there are multiple members of the board of oversight on here, Joyce, do you want to call a meeting to order? You're muted. <laughs> okay hi um it's a good idea we'll officially uh call the meeting of the south county senior center board of oversight meeting uh with trevor and myself present and the folks from our wonderful feasibility study committee um and that's really the only item on our agenda here today so i will turn it over to um i don't know if jen or someone from the uh, from the team is best to take over next, but I'm relinquishing control <laughs> and feeling good about it. <laughs> Jen, right, I can, I, Jen, okay. I can kind of take it and run with it if you're if you're good with that. Great, wonderful for me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the last time we met, we had a program that we reviewed with the group. Um, I sent out some um, updated documents just before the meeting, just so everybody has, you know, the documents in front of them that they can review then after after the discussion, um, if you guys um, are so inclined. Um, and what we had mainly accomplished, accomplished last meeting was taking the overall program that, you know, Doug and I have, had worked on and um, started to put priority on each item. And that's that's what you guys saw in the updated documents that I sent out was trying to list out, you know, the different pieces and parts that we've discussed and identify, you know, what does the high priority spaces look like? What would that size of a building look like? What would it look like for, you know, the high and the medium combined? And then, you know, we have low priority that we really haven't been looking at. So what we did with those documents is start to investigate what would a building of that size, and when I say that size, there's actually two sizes. There's the high and the medium program square footage is combined. And then there's just the high priority. We kind of looked at it in two, two pieces. So when we started looking at each site, each of the three sites, we were looking at them from a really high level. What kind of square footage can fit within the existing building? What kind of square footage would need to be um, added to get to the high and the medium priority option. Is it a small addition? Is it a you know tear down? We just we're, we were looking at a bunch of different high, super high level options. We haven't designed anything yet. We haven't put rooms in the spaces. We haven't um, you know designed what the structure looks like. We're looking at purely from a site standpoint. What can each site accommodate? You know from a thirty thousand foot view. And that's mainly what I wanted to review with the group today. We're going to go through each site and just understand what's the target program, what's the target square footage requirements with the parking attached to it. And from a diagrammatic standpoint, what does that look like on each site? So I'm going to share my screen and um, I will run through um, the different components. We have um, Phil and Brian from our from our team, they're the site designers. They helped put together most of the um, site diagrams, so they're going to kind of jump in here and there um, to help fill in any blanks that I might have missed. So, um, Jen, could you switch on the, the sharing for me? Yeah, I think I did, but hold on. There we go. It just worked. All right, great. All right, so just super high level recap. Here is the, the Excel file that we had been playing with last time. I tried to clean it up and make it a little bit more graphic in, in terms of understanding green is high priority. That means we, we really need those spaces. 
the orange is medium priority. They'd be highly desirable, but, you know, could potentially be left off in, in, um, you know, in case cost or size was a, was an issue. And then the low priorities in red, that's stuff that we're not really considering at this point, um, in terms of planning for this, this new facility. So we ended up in the high priority category. We ended up with about, you know, a little over 7,000 square feet. This is grossed up. When I mean, when we say grossed up, we mean the net is the addition of all of the different square footages for each of the different rooms. The gross factor includes things like, you know, wall thicknesses and, you know, chases and things that aren't necessarily specifically in the room. Corridors always. Um, and we get to a total that combines both of those numbers of about 7,000 square feet for both the high priority and the medium priority, you know, give or take. So if we were to combine both of them, we got a 14,000 square foot facility. That number, you know, again, is very high level. If this thing, you know, changes in shape or whatnot, that number can go up or down depending on how efficient we can get it. But again, just from a diagrammatic standpoint, we're looking at this at a super high level. Um, I updated the program to include the spaces that we removed last discussion. So we talked about a secondary lounge. There were some other spaces that we said, nope, nope, not even on the low priority. We don't even want to consider those. So we just kind of struck through them. I added the priority list and updated at the bottom of the, the spreadsheet, you know, the different square footages of each of the different priorities. Again, just to try to make it really easy to understand. So from a site evaluation standpoint, you know, we're looking at, does the program fit? We're going to review some test fits. Um, can we knock out any of the options right, right off the bat because they don't work, you know, logically, they don't work from a cost standpoint. They don't work from a, you know, feasibility standpoint. And the next step would be to try to narrow this thing down into two sites that we'd further investigate. And we really start to drill into what is the actual design of the space? What are the different where are the different rooms? How are they located? You know, are we talking about renovation only? Are we talking about something a little bit more in some of the sites? We want to kind of get, we want to get to a point today where we can move forward with a couple of different options um, in an ideal scenario. So here's the target programmatic requirements. Um, you know, we, we're talking about a 14, 15,000 square foot footprint of a single story building. You know, for we looked at a couple of scenarios of what would a two-story building look like. You know, that gross is up a little bit higher because we have to worry about things like stairs and elevators. But you know, again, just from a from a concept standpoint, how many parking spaces? You know, based on our experience, would we we'd be looking for? This is about the number of parking in the ideal scenario, and then program space for outdoors. You know, green space and whatnot. Um, this is graphically how that's represented: fifteen thousand. 50,000 and 5,000. So again, high level. If every if we had the perfect site, how everything fit, we'd be looking at two and a, roughly two and a half acres of overall site space to fit it. Again, we know we're not working in the ideal situation with perfectly open site, but again, got to start somewhere. Um, talking about the high priority, which is kind of the baseline that we're working off of, we're at about you know seven, eight thousand square feet which would require roughly 50 parking spaces and the, the outdoor program when we're talking high priority, you know, TBD unknown, depending on the different sites. So really starting to hone in on what does that first option really look like? And then looking at evaluation criteria of each site, ultimately what we're tasked here is comparing the different sites in all different respects with all different types of criteria. Today, all we're looking at is what's the adequate building area and what's the adequate parking area. That really helps us hone in on which sites and which options should we be even looking at further. It would not make any sense to look at all of these components if one of the sites really doesn't fit the building or the parking at all. And we say, we want to throw that out the window. So the first step is to really look at these two things and see how they fit. And those are the diagrams that you're going to see coming up here. So we're going to start with the South Deerfield site. So just to orient everybody, the, um, Highlighted area here with the big A on it. That's our site. That's the con Congregational Church. We have the um, 1888 building here with B. The E is the library. F is going back towards the ball field. And then the police and the town hall building on C and D. So that's that's the that's the church site that we're looking at. Um, let me try to 
narrow this down. You can see the key in the legend, um, just identifying the current parking that we have on site. You know, we have roughly combined with all of the different parcels here in this corner. We're looking at about 86 parking spaces. If we're looking at what are the upcoming projects and how do those affect our site, we have the library project and we have the proposed 1888 project that Chris is Chris and I have been going back and forth on talking about, you know, where where is that in the process and how does that affect the other um you know, how does that affect our parcel? So we we tried to put those designs in an overlay over the existing site. So once everything, if we if everything worked in a perfect sequence, library gets finished, 1888, 1888 building gets finished, and then our project, before we start our project, we have about 106 parking spaces on site with the upgrades to the library and to the town hall. And again, just kind of try to gesture at what, does that look like from a site plan standpoint? So this is what we're going to be working with and showing you guys is with these upcoming projects as the backdrop to, you know, how we would look at um, renovating the building. So you can see here, we have the library here, we have the 1888 project here, and we're working within, you know, a fairly small area um, of space. So this option is, what if we just renovated the building? How does that fit? What does that mean for parking? How could we potentially steal some space in the back and try to get as much senior center specific parking as possible? Again, this isn't even looking at how does the spaces fit within the existing structure. This is just, all right, what's the size of the building? The building's you know a little bit over 7,000 square feet. Where could we find parking outside of what the town hall and what the library are giving us? And how does that stack up to the target program? So we have this yellow box that gestures at what if we put the parking in the back? We think we could get maybe 25 spaces plus or minus um, with potential connection to the existing, what will be the existing parking for the library in the town hall building. And what does that mean for the program? So right here, we're looking at a target of, and this is for the, the medium and the high priority, but if we just said the high priority, it seems like we would meet the high priority program. Um, but with the parking, if we're looking at about 50 spaces required for the senior center, without talking about sharing parking, we're at about 25. So we're, you know, well below what the target parking would be for the high priority only. Um, how does this accommodate the high and the medium priority, you can see pretty quickly we're, you know, without modifying the existing structure, we're pretty far away from the target of the um, adequate building size and the parking size. The next option would be, all right, what if we, and again, these are all just high level ideas, you know, bear with us here, but this idea would be, all right, what if we took down the church? What if we tore it down, which is basically been the recommendation of the previous consultants that did the existing building analysis. And you'll probably notice, but in our existing um, report, it's probably going to say something very similar that the building has reached its end of life and would be very difficult to accommodate a senior center. So this option looks at what if we tore the building down and put in a 8,000 square foot footprint of a two-story senior center? What would that what would that yield? So you can kind of see what a two-story footprint looks like on the site. It takes up a very similar square foot footprint of the existing structure. Could we expand out towards the back even more than we were showing before to try to get 50 spaces for the senior center? And maybe the ball field gets rotated. I think there was a VHB study, which was a, another consultant that was you know involved in the site in the past. Maybe the ball field gets rotated, so it's still usable, and we're stealing a little bit more parking for, you know, the senior center, specifically for the senior center. Again, not talking about shared parking, which we can get into later, but this is just looking at the senior center um, by itself. And then this option, which after I had more conversations with Chris um, from Deerfield, it was a, 
that this became clear that this option really wasn't viable. But we, again, just throwing big picture ideas out there, we were like, oh, well, maybe we can tag team this onto the 1888 project, put the senior center out the back with the combination town hall senior center building in some way, shape or form. And maybe the, where the church location just becomes one large parking lot, you know, for all of the different um, organizations on this, this parcel. And, um, but we weren't aware that that town hall project was a little bit further along um, than we anticipated. So we studied it, we showed it, talked to Chris, realized it really wasn't viable, but wanted to show it anyways, just as a way to say, hey, we looked at it, understand it's not viable, but you know, it was one of our studies and we thought it was worth showing. Um, so what this did was it got us to our program for the medium and the high, and it got us pretty close to the adequate parking um, requirements for, you know, a 16, 15,000 square foot senior center. So I'm, I'm going to go through a lot here. If you guys will just bear with me, I'm going to go through the other two schemes. They're a little bit less complicated than this one, but we'll, I'll go through all of them and then we'll come back and I'll answer any questions and we can focus on any of the options that you guys want to focus on. But let, let me just get through all of them and, and bear with me here. Uh, actually, Brian, did you have anything else or Doug on this one that you wanted to add? I'm good for now. Good for now. I think it's I think it's pretty clear that like parking is a challenge on this one. Yeah. So then we studied Sandy Lane, which I apologize the the title up here should actually say Waitley. Um, for you know a little miss on our part, but this is the Sandy Lane site. Um, the existing building we wanted to identify you know, how much parking is currently on site and what is the available square footage in the building currently. And this diagram just shows um, how that interior space is divided. As you all know, there's kind of an upper level and a lower level. This is where the loading dock is, where the lower is quote unquote lower building is. So if you combine them, you know, we're a little bit over 5,000 square feet, but you know, more or less half of the building is down three feet and change and half of the building is up three feet and change. So it it creates a fairly difficult um, interior space to work with when we're talking about um, trying to fit a senior center into the existing square footage. So again, just to try to fit the base target program, the high priority program, we would most likely have to add to the structure to get to the 8,000, 7,000 square feet. Um, so what would that look like? That would look like this little 3,000 square foot box off of the back. It wouldn't be terribly difficult to extend you know, the existing structure and create more square footage. But again, we're adding space to the lower level and we'd still have a good chunk of the space divided by that change in grade or the change in finished floor from the lower level to the upper level. We were looking at, you know, potentially if we redid the parking lot and we expanded it, you know, without doing a full layout, how much parking would that get us if we were to try to steal some more of the square footage um, around, you know, these green spaces here, we could potentially get up to 88, we thought, again, if we took all this area. Um, and then we looked at what would it, you know, would it make any sense to have an additional access drive for the senior center drop off if we were to say the new built the new front entrance of the senior center could be here you know would a new drive off the back side with drop off on the passenger side would that be helpful um with a scheme like this so just starting to dot that in and, and gesture at maybe adding another access drive to uh, facilitate you know pick up and drop off at the at a front door that could potentially be located um, on the south side of the site Again, just taking it a step further, if we wanted to accommodate the medium and the high priority, what would that look like on the site? Um, again, trying to take as much of the parking space as possible to, to gain more parking. Um, just extending that addition area off the south side of the site a little bit more, trying to create that 15, roughly 15,000 square foot footprint um, so we got the, the blue area here is the addition, got the lower level and then the upper level. 
the back area would stay green here. And we thought maybe there's a potential to steal some more parking out on the front that we could say could be staff only type of parking to try to get um, more senior center and more public parking towards the, the front door here, which we were envisioning the front door would be closer to this inside corner. Um, we don't have that that nice drop off that we were looking at um, on the other one, but you know we feel like we could potentially reorient some of the the uh, parking here to get maybe a circular pattern, uh, a circular traffic pattern to get that drop off and get people in and out of the site in a fairly organized manner. So where does this one get us? We thought maybe we get to 93 parking spaces total with the additional staff parking up in here. You lose a little, little bit of green space, but we felt like that was a, there was a potential there to get and steal some more parking. And then again, just one more one more option to study on the, the optimal option, which is the medium and the high priority square footage. Maybe we put the addition off the back of the building and the drive aisle, the extra drive aisle stays here. You know, what would that look like? Maybe the front of the building is is along this face. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we leave all the parking towards the south. We could still potentially put parking up on the front here if we wanted to. That there's no reason why we couldn't, but um just an option of, all right, what if we just kept the parking down towards the south and we added towards the north? What would that look like? Um, and that's kind of how this was yielded. Um, mm -hmm. So again, looking at things high level, just trying to figure out, all right, what are our priorities? Do we really want the high and the medium priorities? Here's how it would fit if we wanted to just do the, the high priorities. You know, looking at a, a small addition here, we don't think we could fit all the programmatic pieces into the existing footprint. So that's kind of how we're, we're looking at this, um, the Waitley site at Sandy Lane. And then the Sunderland site, existing conditions, we got about 48 spaces plus or minus. We have about 12,000 square feet total in the building, um, you know, with this little O shape with the addition off the side. Um, all of the structure is inside is non-load bearing in terms of you know existing walls and whatnot. So we could pretty much carve up the building however we wanted to. Um, so the square footage is is fairly open to you know modification, but um, you know, how does that compare to the to the target program and target parking? If we said just the high priority, you know, we it seems like we would we could fit in here if we just did the 7,000 square feet, just the high priority list with the parking, you know, the, uh, roughly 50 parking spaces. This one seems like it actually meets the program with very little um, modifications with some space to spare on the inside of the building. If you're talking about the medium and the high priority, obviously we're not quite there. We would have to provide some type of addition off the back or in some part of the building and expand the parking um, off to the east, reorganize it, and potentially, you know, add some um, connection for emergency access or whatever towards the back of the um, the back of the the site. So I know that was a lot. I know there was a ton of information there that I kind of threw at you all, um, mm -hmm. Doug and and Brian. Did you have any other pieces you wanted to add to the last two sites before we kind of turn it over to questions and answers? I think one of the issues on this site that that you know, we would want to be looking at doing some sort of modification to the site regardless is to try to create a, a drop off pickup area, um, you know, near a front door and, and, you know, the front door may be where the front door is now, or it may be something that's not, that's changed. So it's on the right hand side. But, um, you know, I think we would want to try to get some drop off pickup uh, lane close to the building, which doesn't exist. On the previous site, maybe Chris, if you flip over back um, the, the, one of, one of the things that we don't really know at this point in time, and you may be able to, may be able to give us a better understanding, or maybe you don't have an understanding of it yet either is, is what seemed to be the parking needs of the existing building with who's been left in that building. Um, and, and what impact that that might have with regard to the, the need for overall parking on the site. So those are, that's kind of a, a, a question that, 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 we'd like more information on if, if that information is available. There 
was just also a comment that was brought to our attention about um, plum tree site about zoning. So I have some of our planning folks looking into the zoning question that came up about the basically existing non-conformance of the, of the lot based on the zoning. So we'll get you an answer on that. But at this point, we don't we don't see it as a, you know, stop stop point. So just wanted to update you guys on that. Brian, do you want to explain a little bit about what that non-conformance is right now, just so the whole group has an understanding? Yeah. So you guys know this, the, the property itself is uh, a plum tree address, which the zoning there requires 200 feet of frontage. I believe there's only 90 at, at most. Um, so it's a, it's a non-conforming lot. We will do our confirmation on if we need to change that zoning or get a modification for the site. But um, I'll follow up with you guys on, on what that means as far as the zoning. It's just, as you can tell, this specific lot and use doesn't exactly fit the residential neighborhood that it currently exists in. Right. One of the other things, Chris, go to the next slide. The, the connection that we've identified is emergency access only that was just a point of discussion that if we had if we had a hundred parking spaces on this site, um, you know, and there was a large event in the building, would would there be an option to possibly be able to to exit out of the bottom of the site and over to Plum Tree rather than trying to get all one hundred cars out out on Plum Tree at one time? So that was more of a matter of of movement of vehicles and and how to access the site and whether or not even a, a, a curb cut could, could be put on that that uh, that lower location. But uh, that was just our thinking process on that. So just, just to kind of summarize, um, you know, we looked at this from a standpoint of what, based on the program, fits on each site. And we totally understand you know, we eventually have to get to some sort of reality in terms of budget and what we think that this project can actually accommodate. Um, you know, my understanding from the beginning of the process was, you know, we were trying not to go full bore with a whole new building and, a you know, a, a large project wasn't really the appetite. It's, it, it's some of the stuff that we're showing could be perceived as a large project. But again, we're at such an early stage that we want to at least show it and talk about it and make sure that, you know, the group understands what we talked about prior. This is what the impact is. This is how it, this is how it, you know, manifests itself on each site, just so the information is out there. If ultimately we decide, hey, what you guys are showing, these are these projects are way too big. We need to scale back on things. That's certainly some of the stuff that we want to hear and some of the stuff we need to know so that we can start to hone in on, all right, where do we think this thing is going? Because ultimately we have to work towards the end of the year to present a final, you know, a couple of options that are much more developed than these. But, you know, we want to be able to show at that final, you know, in that final presentation or the final discussion, here are the things that we studied along the way and here are the sacrifices that we had to make in order to get to what we think, you know, these towns are looking for or these towns can accommodate. Um, so with all of that kind of thrown out there on the table, we're eager to hear, you know, everybody's feedback in terms of how they think this responds to the program, how they think this aligns with their expectations. And ultimately we'd love to get some feedback as to where we should be going from here um, so that we can work towards that end of the year goal of, of wrapping this whole thing up. So um, with that, I'll open it up to any questions, any comments, any um, feedback that 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 you guys might have. Okay. Stop sharing the screen so we can all talk to each other. Thank you. Yeah. Also, um, I just wanted to say, after going on a tour with you, Chris, um, for those, uh, Chris and I went to the uh, Hadley Senior Center um, and met with uh, their director, Nikki. Lacori. Um, and I think having a vestibule is important because it gives people, um, you know, especially depending on where they're coming in, if that's where the, you know, the greeter area is, the reception area, whatever, um, you know, has that barrier between the hot and cold. Um, I think that's important. Um, 
because you know some some of our numbers may be a little slower getting in. So that if we end up having a um, slider door, whatever kind of door we have, um, you know, it may have uh, the heat and the cold going in and out uh, longer than normal. But um, I think also, you know, if we wanted to cut the um, employee bathroom, um, you know, as an option, um, they shared that they all use the same facility and it seemed to be clean, uh, you know, not too bad. Everything was pretty much motion censored for, for that. So I think uh, you know, depending on what we have for those pieces, that could potentially reduce, you know, some square footage um, for, for that space. Mm -hmm. um, but I think everything else that you have in the high and low is, in, you know, or high medium uh, was really, really where we were. Um, and I think, you know, in my, my professional opinion, um, parking is a major issue that we have now, um, even at the Sunderland Congregational Church for our food distribution. Um, you know, we are having people park at our site over here on 22 Amherst Road. Some folks are parking up by the uh, Sunderland Town Hall or the park and ride area and walking down if they have the ability. Um, parking is really essential to consider because a lot of the events that we have have for example, the food distribution. Um, some people have stopped coming because of the limited parking. Um, so in that space there, I think we can accommodate maybe 40 cars and staff, you know, in uh, parks over here at our space and volunteers have been parking in different areas as well. Um, so having at least 80 parking spaces, I think maybe, you know, even the 100 is essential. Um, regardless of where we are and you know with you showing what's going on in um south deerfield i think is a concern um if you know we're not doing shared parking um because we're not going to be able to um host and meet the need the aging population in our three communities is only increasing it's not going to decrease and i think everybody should be mindful of that in the next 20 years, you're not going to want to revisit this again. You're barely getting people to be on board in the three towns now for a senior center um, for a priority. So I think, you know, we have to look at the long-term uh, effect of this project. And, you know, so I think uh, meeting the needs, you know, we can reuse different rooms, unlike Hadley, which has rooms that are specifically purposed for certain things, you know, having multiple uh activities in different rooms is great but the parking is is going to be my my biggest thing regardless of where we have the building we need to look at that yeah. um i had a couple of questions about things in chris's uh, presentation and i think yeah. they're probably going to be pretty quick ones um i was noticing um on the the north main street um, you very consistently put in like where the green space was going to be and the, the green space I think was a little bit less but not not too different from what we were um, thinking about mm -hmm. um, and uh, except like maybe the last one doesn't have a green space in it um, for the Sandy Lane similarly a lot of them didn't have the green space marked out but on that site there's a lot of other places that are kind of obvious. So I'm I'm assuming then that at Four Sandy Lane, the first two not having green space mapped out just means, oh yeah, there's that green space out front. You can see it. And that wasn't um that wasn't yeah. really it's not that they it doesn't say exactly how much, but it's clearly more than five thousand, which I think five thousand was the target. Um yeah, so yeah, we could have we, we could have definitely showed the additional right. spaces on there, but I think yeah. It, so our, our um, thought was that there it, it, the green space is ample there and we can find right. but that yeah because that wasn't a constraint it wasn't really pointed out exactly uh, yeah country point. road i guess um uh on the very first one you, there is that big green space in the back there's the green spaces that are kind of in the front of the existing building those all um seem also pretty obvious that they're going to be somewhere around the 5,000 square foot, even if you put the building addition in, um, right. there would still, you're taking 3,000 away from something that's still going to leave something like uh, 5,000 of usable. Um, so I just wanted to make sure 
that my yep. assumptions about, yep. oh, that's why the green space isn't labeled is- Very good it, point. Yep, very okay, good no, point. The, the no, idea okay. was just- I don't want to make assumptions that aren't <laughs> that aren't what you were thinking of. Totally get it. Yep, but you're okay. correct. And this might be too uh, too much in the weeds, but um, looking at the four sandy lanes, since that's actually the one I'm the most familiar with, the what do you call the upper building is actually like huge in the vertical direction. Yes. And um, if we, I mean, maybe it just makes it too complicated. But was there any thought, or is it not yet? The time to think about making that into two stories of programming space inside the existing warehouse part of that building. I don't know if that makes sense to think about now, or if that's really something for a later time. If so this one makes was, it into a cut. I think looking at it from a high level, it would make a lot of sense to try to use that vertical space. The reality with that type of structure, it's a it's what's called a pre-engineered metal building, uh -huh. and those structures are designed. They're fairly cost effective, but they're cost effective because they're designed to the minimum, minimum, minimum requirements for what it's yeah. built for. So to add anything to a pre-engineered building, like even saying, hey, add, you know, 10 solar panels on the roof, everybody gets nervous because, you know, there's not a lot of extra structural capacity for that type of system. So to add a whole second floor is not really feasible for that type of structure. Adding on to, you know, against uh -huh. these buildings you know, that aren't taking any structural load, that's feasible. Oh, okay. It takes a little bit of reworking, but it's not as difficult yeah. as basically you, what we'd be doing is building a whole nother structure inside the structure. Build the support the in because the walls are not meant to. Okay. Exactly. The, the foundations, sure. the walls, yeah, everything's not designed to accommodate a whole nother floor. So you so could an it, obvious you basically be building thing. a structure inside of the structure. Yeah. You'd have to be a little more pressed for space, I think. Yeah, it I sounds like right. to uh, to consider that to be a, a yeah. better option than some of the options you've laid out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So those are the first, those are the two questions I wrote down while we were talking. I'm going to still keep thinking, but let somebody else ask questions. <laughs> Chris, Greg, Trevor, Pete, any initial impressions? Things you hate, things you love. Uh, you know, I was just going to say uh, one. Great job. Like, I think this presentation presented the information super clearly, the trade-offs, the challenges, the opportunities with each site. Um, so I feel like we <laughs> we have the homework done um, and, you know, there's some tough decisions to be made. Um, you know, one thing I want to mention, um, obviously, you know, with the 1888 project, if that moves forward, um, you know, the building I'm currently in, the current town offices for the town of Deerfield, that's another question mark. Um, so I don't know if that's something to consider in terms of parking or actual, you know, senior center space. I don't want to throw like another option at you guys at this point. Um, but I do think that adds kind of another layer of flexibility to the, the, the sort of municipal campus we have here in South Deerfield. So just wanted to throw that out there. I had a question, uh, uh Greg Stenicker, I'm the new ATA here in Deerfield. So, uh, Thanks for uh, letting me join. Um, just curious, what is the plan for public transportation uh, for the, you know, the, for this new facility? Is there any uh, discussions regarding uh, any public transit going to be, you know, have it be a drop-off area pickup? Yes, actually, um, I've been working with a high Greg on Jen Remillor, uh, okay. the director here at the center. Um, we, um, we've been working with the PBTA and the FRTA to try to bridge the gap between the transportation issue here. We have a really good partnership with the PBTA that's ongoing, um, and we've already spoken with them. Um, their, their service area includes Sunderland, so they would be able to add a stop for the Sunderland space there um, over in the um the Plum Tree Road space. In, in regards to the Waitley space, um, for the four Sandy Lane, um, that we just have to determine because I believe Waitley is just solely FRTA, but so we would be able to provide transportation, um, over for that particular space, um, hopefully with a ongoing, um, discussion between the FRTA and the PBTA. Now, in regards to the, um, the North Main Street space, um, 
you know, there there is some transportation in the center of town, but it doesn't buff up that far. So, um, you know, that's that's an ongoing conversation. I think um, we're currently just starting a project with the PBTA and we're doing some service. Um, we're adding to the service area here in Sunderland to go all the way up to Greenfield, um, but we're not bumping over into, um, you know, going through Route 5 through South Deerfield for that. They're using the highway option. Um, so, but that's, you know, also a discussion of a joint grant with the PBT and the FRTA. It's been an ongoing issue. And one of the ways that we've been able to circumvent some aspect of that um, is we just received um, CIPC funds from each of the three towns to uh, put the 20% for a new vehicle or new van that we're supposed to get uh, possibly next year or in 2026. Uh, depending on the delivery point. Um, but we're also in talks with the PBTA to partner to get them to uh, basically support us getting another vehicle without having to do a match through this grant process cycle. Um, and we've been able to offer transportation. Um, at this point, we've had, being in this location, we've had more folks attend the center on public transit than we have um, and the other location in uh, South Deerfield when we were at the Holy Family Parish, which is before we came here. Prior to that, I'm unaware because um, there was no statistical data really captured prior to me starting. Um, so, you know, that is a concern we have and we're trying to, you know, look at, look at all the facets. I think the biggest solution will be having the target space um, and then we'll be able to expand that conversation. But we've Great. also done programs to have people learn how to ride the bus too. So we're public transit, uh, which has really been helpful. Just, just kind of related to that, uh, Doug or Chris, I'm curious. So have you guys worked on any senior centers that have sort of shared parking with other facilities? And you know, how did that work? Did it work? Um, I'm just curious to hear. We, we have. Um... I, I guess the real the real issue with parking and, the, and 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 just time and time and time again, parking ends up becoming the tail wagging the dog on these projects. Um, you know, and as Jennifer said, they don't have enough parking, and 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 she's visited other facilities. I don't know any senior center that's ever said, "Oh, we have so much parking; it's wonderful." Um, the problem with shared is it's it's it goes both ways. You know, if the library's got a big event going on. All of a sudden, they're parking in the senior center parking lot as well, and and the the issue with senior centers is is predominantly everybody comes in their own car, and most people are one car, one person. You add public transportation, um, and and there are people who are going to take take public transportation, but if it's only if it's convenient to get to a to to a, a bus stop to get on it. Otherwise, they want to go to their garage or, you know, or their driveway and get in their car and, and, and get to the senior center. Um, additionally, if we create a better, bigger senior center, more people may pay, more people may take public transportation, but more people are going to want to come to the senior center. Um, so it's the bottom line is I don't know that we've ever seen a flawless shared parking situation. And you know, and and you know, at 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 the the uh, the town campus, if we've got police and town hall and library and senior center, and there's a public meeting going on at town hall, and the library has some special event going on, and the senior center's there, all of a sudden nobody's going to have enough parking. You know, it's that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's um, very cautious to to assume certain overlaps. Because there are going to be times when when it's going to fail significantly, and you know, and and you know, the the old adage from from parking is, you know, you don't you don't plan for Easter Sunday when you design a church, um, but uh, senior centers, because of what they are and the people who are coming, and hopefully more people are coming, um, that demand is always going to be high. Yeah. And the the facility that. Um... Jennifer and I toured down in Hadley, Mass. There is a pseudo shared parking situation there. We have, you know, our site 
our art building is located on the same parcel as the new library. Those projects actually were constructed at the same exact time. Um, and there's a parking lot that's connecting the two. And we spent a lot of time designing that area with the design team from the library group. And, um, you know, I was talking to Jane, one of the select board members and the senior center director there when, when, when Jennifer and I were down there and they definitely have, you know, issues when there are large events planned for both, you know, the library and the senior center. And, you know, is it every single day that they have issues? No, but there's, you know, a handful of times throughout the year where there's, you know, serious parking constraints and it limits what they can or can't do. Um, and it just makes everybody's life a little bit more difficult in terms of coordinating and, you know, compromising and, you know, whatnot. So like, like Doug said, is it impossible? No. Is it, have we found a flawless situation? That's also a no, um, unfortunately. So that's just the reality. I mean, one of the things we did also down in Chicopee, um, the Chicopee parking lot is, was oversized. We planned, we planned for it to be oversized because we were planning for the future. And, and there, there was discussion about the possibility of adding adult daycare to that site. And also the, um, the, the uh, trail that runs along the river there and runs through town. Um, we wanted that site to also be a general parking area for people that wanted to use that trail, bring their bikes and use that trail. Um, and, and even with that, that parking lot has, has, has absorbed the amount of parking that's, that's necessary for that site. So um, in the future, if they do go ahead and add an adult day facility on that parcel, um, there still probably is enough because of adult day is people being dropped off and picked up um, rather than people driving their own cars. But, um, uh, you know, it was something that was taken into account and, and um, I think it still will absorb what's necessary there. But, but you know, we didn't want to make that any smaller because the trail and the bikes and all of that are certainly going to continue to be popular. And, and that's a great place where people can go and, and park to go and get access to that as well. We have added and are in the midst of adding the Leary lot, which is not far from the Peterfield campus, you know, for people in town that are able to walk to the library or different things like that. So we'll have some excess parking there. The parking looks like it's a mess everywhere. So, um, these are all really good plans, just trying to figure out what's the most feasible, what's the most doable um, with money that we have or don't have. Um, right. And just trying to get something to something to happen. We've been homeless for years here, and we've just got to kind of come up with something that's the most feasible thing. And then we're going to always struggle with one aspect of it, one way or the other. I don't think there's a perfect option because we don't have a we don't have a five acre lot that's empty that we can just drop a, a building on. Um, exactly. Yeah. So it's just a matter of struggling, uh, finding out which one, which one is most available, most feasible, most, you know, reasonable to get going in the next year or two. Yeah. Well, what are your, what do you, maybe, maybe I can, maybe I can help kind of guide the discussion a little bit. What are your general thoughts now that you've seen what a purely high priority building would look like on each site versus a high and medium priority building? What is the group's thought on, which direction you think we need to go in, in terms of, you know, what's the building that we're designing to? Is it a 8,000 square foot building or is it a 15,000 square foot building? What, is there any thoughts on, on that topic? Well, I think we need, we need a 15,000, but I, I don't know that's going to pass the town meeting. Um, I just don't yeah. see 15,000 square foot. Yeah. I sort of feel like at the moment we don't really have enough information to know whether something's going to be like too expensive or have some other um, feature that would make it tank at town meetings because we don't really have numbers on any of these because sure. because we're still at the at the yeah. high level. Yeah. So we're trying to look at my understanding is we're trying to look at this high level and say, where are we most likely to find something where we'll satisfy enough of the needs that people will support it? Uh, within um, a budget where where you know we can um, somehow manage it and um, I kind of um, I, I was like 
when you're looking at the plum tree circle, I'm just like, oh, can we go take another look at that medium priority list and so <laughs> make that into medium one and medium two? Because um, at plum tree, it looks like it would be relatively straightforward to sure. um, mm -hmm. uh, put some of those in the existing space. And um, it, but again, then parking is the thing there. And then we have to kind of um, uh, deal with that in whatever is the best way. Um, I guess at the at the risk of sounding like, you know, completely uninformed about everything, um, <laughs> uh, that people are mostly understanding about parking when it's related to events. That like, we, we used to have our town meeting in our old town hall when there was like almost no parking along Main Street. There's like a teeniest, tiniest parking lot there. And then we just had cars lined up on either side of the main road. And you would never put up with that every day. But everybody's like, yeah, it's town meeting. Of course, there's going to be 100 cars parked. And people would carpool. And so when there were big events, we put up with it and um, and and kind of find a way. So I, I and, and everybody is very seems pretty okay and I would say everybody because they're never going to talk to everybody but by and large people were okay with that I think one of the differences here is that we're often dealing with mobility impaired people so there should be a way to drop people off closer yeah. um, and they may or may not be driving many of them are not driving uh, and then their transportation if they need to park can be can be a little further away so I guess I'm not as um I'm not as worried about public support for a place that maybe on paper doesn't have enough parking for Easter Sunday, for lack of a better word, or town meeting day. Um, uh, mostly because I, I think that's what people are thinking about here. So in, in that sense, I, the shared parking most of the time works. And uh, when it doesn't, it's usually predictable when that's going to happen because people advertise their events. So that's my completely... Um, uninformed and uh, ill-considered <laughs> thoughts on the, the parking part. I um, sort of feel like, um, yeah, I mean, in, in a way, you're, you're sort of asking us to eliminate maybe one of these, one of these pieces. Um, and yeah. okay. that uh, and I guess the, you know, with public transit is always a tricky thing because it's funding is not, very, you know, we don't have a history of great funding for public transit. And it is definitely public transit around here is really just getting from Greenfield to Northampton, Amherst to that parking lot uh, up in the north corner of, of Waitley there. It, it, it's really just going through on the major roads. It's not getting somebody from their home in West Waitley down to the senior center. Um so I, I don't want to say public transit isn't important because I love it when I'm in Stockholm, but we're not Stockholm. <laughs> and no, nobody's, you know, they, they, we just don't have a convenient public transit that's likely to serve a large number. So while I, I, I think we should work to change that, that's just what reality is. And, and that's been that way since 1993 when I first, or 1994 when I first moved here. So I I don't think citing with respect to public transit is necessarily a big priority for the decision we make today either. Uh, and that's unfortunate. And I say that as somebody who would really, really like to use public transit to go to my senior center. But it's never going to get me from the top of the hill in Westbrook Road over to whatever senior center, any of these sites. Um, in some sense, um, the... The Plum Tree Road seems like the site that could do the most with the least change, and change is what costs money. So I feel like that should be on there. That said, I know one of the other things. Um, I'm I'm scrolling on the thing uh, on your PDF. Yeah. Um, I know when we start to look at other evaluation criteria, yeah. the location of that is going to be an issue. Yeah. This is going to, it's set right there to serve Amherst. So the movie no? in Turkey, right? <laughs> Does it cost anything? No? no? Yeah. 
Uh, one of thought, you know, Rand brought up here, which I thought was a good idea, was I, I never even thought of that. Yeah, it's it's uh, been designing North Main Street to have diagonal parking. Yeah, you know, that's a lot of the, that's a lot of yeah. lot. I mean, it's North Main Street you could land at seven forty seven on, <laughs> and uh, the good fuck of you know. So there's that's a that yeah. thought. Yeah, you know, yeah. I went to throw out there because I thought that was a good very idea. nice good thought. So, so. Yeah. Yeah. So to to me in the back of my mind, this location thing, this central location is you, know about it, it, you didn't put it in the number one. So if we're that. just looking at building area and capacity, it looks really good, but it also it's um the proximity, uh, you know, it's it's not that centrally located. And that's my only reservation about it. I really love a lot of other sure. things about that space. Well, what you're saying makes a lot of sense in terms of kind of how I've been, you know, evaluating these things yeah. is Sunderland just saying, all right, we understand to meet the program, we got to add parking and add square footage. But, you know, what if one of the options is, all right, fit as much as you can in there, we'll deal with the parking and like that's option one, right? Option one is Sunderland with the least amount of impact as possible, fit as much as you can, that's it. Right. And then we'll start to look at all the other criteria. Option two, Sandy Lane and, you know, the uh, South Deerfield site, those have similar challenges in terms of building area, right, where the existing structure, and I'd like to talk more about that maybe in a, in a minute here, but the existing structure there, in our opinion, just it, it's going to be really difficult to say, let's renovate the church and turn it into a, a nice senior center. I think that needs to, you know, we need to talk about that more, but in our mind, it's almost like a, a start over, over there. Um, we'll certainly look at renovating it if you guys really, really want us to, and you think that the town would not support, you know, something new in that location, but that's tricky. But then you go to the Sandy Lane one and there's only 5,000 square feet available even if that space is usable and it is, you know, mm -hmm. fairly new, we would have to add something onto it. So yeah. both of those sites have building issues. So yeah. maybe some of the other evaluation criteria comes into play here where everybody says, all right, if it's going to take a decent amount of modification to these two structures at these two sites to make the building area work, what other criteria could we look at? to maybe narrow things down. Maybe that central location makes the South Deerfield site, you know, more desirable than the Sandy Lane site if both require building updates and cool. it swings it into, all right, South Deerfield is the plan where we got to modify the building more. Sunderland is the plan where we're limiting things as much as possible. And let's see where that takes us. Like that's kind of how I, I'm thinking yeah. we should be tackling this, but that's just kind of how I've been looking at it. And and I guess the only thing I'd add to that is that um, if if in the in the end costs will be a big factor, of course. Uh, the cost in Sunderland uh, starts from the cost of the building, then whatever renovations interior need to happen. So Correct. if we try and do something with like existing building right. to fit as much of our high and medium priorities as we can, uh, if that were were one ask, and then. Um, the other locations, I think you would not have that just an existing building. You'd want to say existing building plus, um, and why not make it the 15,000? Because those are spaces where the land is already owned, and that would not be an additional cost. Correct. Um, so that those ones are sort of starting from that sort of advantage. So even though additional structure means additional cost, there isn't a purchase price there. You're <laughs> pushing the whole thing up. Yeah. And it's uh, so I think that's not an unfair thing to do is to say, hey, if we do either the Waitley or the Deerfield sites, let's at least consider something that will meet the medium and high priorities both. So the 1,500, 15,000 square foot plans would be the ones that would be worth getting an estimate on. Because if you're going to put something on, I don't think putting something bigger on doesn't double the price necessarily. Um, the, <laughs> the starting no. the construction and owning the land, I think in those two cases really 
that is the advantage of those spaces compared to Sunderland. And right. their location is much more central. That's the other advantage over Sunderland. But um, I, I don't have a good idea about the cost of the building. How much does that compare? And that might be the only way to do it is to actually go in and and say, look at these. Um, and I don't know how many we're allowed to make you look into here. <laughs> um, uh, from my point of view, as many as possible. But it seems like <laughs> if we were to, um, uh, like um, if we were to pick kind of one among the various things you proposed at, in South Deerfield, one of the several things you have proposed about Sandy Lane and one of the things you proposed at Plumtree Road, would that be within our scope of work? Uh, somebody mentioned you know, you're narrowing it down to two sites, but if we yeah. were really specific about which kind of plan, would three sites still be on the table? Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought our scope was to study all three, you know, multiple options for all three. And then for the final final, which was, you know, putting together a pretty picture as to what the site would look like, do a full interior plan, do a full cost estimate, do a full site plan design. I believe that was just to do a detailed design on two sites. Um, I, I believe you're correct there, Chris. I, I know we only have the $75,000 grant to work with at this point. So yeah, yeah keep okay. that's restrained. Um, just one one thing I wanted to add, is I know Chris, you had asked about the just the, the raw square footage. Um, and I think Joyce's point is well taken without you know dollar figures attached to that. It's a little hard to actually get a sense. I will say, yeah. I don't think mentioned these square footages to anyone um, without the 15,000 square feet getting kind of a double take. <laughs> um, you know, people have been sort of shocked by that size. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Um, you know, I think there's been a sort of general reaction. Hey, the, the, the high priority only is maybe a little bit more um, palatable for folks. Understood. And I, and I, I would just like to share, though, I think... Uh, how you're going to get the buy-in from the community is look at what we were able to accomplish in increasing membership by just being at the Holy Family Parish Church. I mean, we went from 124 members when I started in January of 2022 to, four, to over um, almost 500. You know, I don't have the exact number now. I know earlier this year it was 471, but we've added more members, even being in just the spaces that we're, we're limited to at this point. And with the aging population, 15,000 square feet for three towns is not unheard of. If you were going to use one town, I mean, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, Monty, but, um, they, Nikki LaCourie shared and Jane um, talked about you know, the population for, for older adults with a Hadley is close to 5,000 or around there. And yeah. we are at 3,300 now. That's just using 2020 census numbers. That is, you know, just going to get up to probably close to 5,000 by the time you hit another 10 years because, you know, they don't look at the, they don't change the schematics based on the ages um, with, with most of the state uh, data. Points. Um, so, but I know that we were, you know, we had a lot of folks who were on the cusp of hitting that 60 mark. Um, and yes, some people pass away, but we're also looking to bring in younger, older adults, you know, by offering things maybe at a later time or different things like that, you know, regardless of where we end up. So I think, you know, even if you limit it down to 12,000 square feet for tangible space, and then, you know, including the 5,000 for outdoor space um, isn't unheard of when you're looking at the volume of folks. Now, I understand a lot of people go, well, how do you, you know, bring people in? Um, you know, I've brought in over $411,000 in grant money since I started. And right now we have increased, um, thank you, Joyce, <laughs> we've increased you know, a lot of different capabilities. We're giving people um, digital access to be able to do hybrid programming with us. So we have people taking, you know, fine art classes now. So we are broadening the scope. We're not just doing, hey, come in and, you know, um, glue fuzzy eyeballs or, you know, fluffy things on a little craft thing. You know, we're bringing 
programs that people want, people that are really enjoying, they're broadening their horizons. Um, and we're really reducing isolation because if you also look at the statistical data, our solo agers, our numbers are also increasing. So people are looking for ways to create connection and reduce isolation. And that has been my main goal since I started um, and increasing the visibility. Um, last year when we did our postcard mailer, I had folks calling me who had lived in uh, Sunderland and Waitley for more than one for 15 years, one for 20, who never knew a senior center existed. So by doing that, we're reaching people, we're bringing folks in, we're connecting with lower income people by offering a partnership with the DTA for SNAP. So we're not just, you know, a place to go and have coffee where, you know, we're getting ready to show a movie today. You know, we, we have a ton of different things going on. And I think people need to broaden their perspective when they think of a senior center. We could also consider a name change of older adult or an adult community center. I know Long Meadow went for that um, because the highest priority in the most recent needs assessment we have, which was presented in May of 22, um, was a was movement and fitness. Um, so you know, broaden your perspective and your horizons and, you know, get people to look at all of that. It's not just coming to, you know, chat with your friend, although we do encourage that. It's, you know, to to engage and create, um, you know, new abilities for folks, no matter what their age is. So, yeah, I think, uh, Jennifer, I mean, you have your point to all of that and, and, you know, you're, you know, to your credit, you're a very progressive thinker when it comes to expanding. I mean, there are a lot of senior center directors that sit around and don't understand how to get more people through the door. Um, but, you know, 15,000 square feet today <clears throat> um, is on the small side. And, and I think one thing, you know, I mean, I'm talking nationally and what we've seen over the years, but, but the... The one, the one question that, that we always get, and Chris and I have had this conversation many times, is, is that do you size your senior center based on your population or based on the size of your town? And the answer is no. You base your senior center on your activities, your programs, and the services that you're offering, and that's going to expand the amount of people that are coming to the senior center um, and and that's what brings people in. And, and it, it, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it never happens, but every senior center we design, there's always somebody saying it's too big. Why are we spending that kind of money on a building this size? Of course, there's always the people who say we have a great senior center now. Why do we need another one? Um, we ultimately, if we cut the parking count, based on what we normally figure, but they don't have enough parking and their membership just continues to go up year after year after year. I was talking, we were talking to a director of yesterday of a senior center we designed eight, eight or nine years ago and every year they increase their, their membership. And, and, and as a result of that, every year they increase their daily um, attendance as well. And it just continues to go on and on. With that said, we knew they didn't have enough parking when we designed the building, but it was the it was the piece of land they had, like we're talking here. The parking issue becomes more and more of an issue every single year because more and more people are coming and they're expanding their hours. They're open on the weekends now to try to expand their hours. And that's that's a good thing. But when when you do that, then more people even come because there are people who are working for a living and people that like the idea of coming on the weekends. So it's you know, you're kind of going on faith that that's going to happen, but I have yet to see it not happen. Joyce, to go back to what you were saying, which was you'd really like to see some cost information on some of these things that we're, we're talking about here. We might be able to come up with a compromise and high level, you know, rough order of magnitude, not fully designing things, but saying, all right, based on our data, what is a what does renovation square foot cost? So if we're saying we're going to renovate 3,000 square feet, what is that general cost per square foot? We could probably tweak it a little bit and say, all right, if that plus 
a 5,000 square foot addition, what would that square foot cost be based on our data? You know, that's another, you know, chunk of change. We could potentially identify, you know, really high level costs for each option to say, this is roughly where you're going to be just so we can start to compare things that yeah. might, you know, the decision a little bit more. Um, so maybe that's something that we could do. And then we can narrow things down further yeah. to basically, because I, because I don't think that the design, you know, what the building looks like is going to be a, a decision-making factor. It's cost. It's what program can you fit and what parking can you fit that those are kind of the main things at this point. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So if we could add that cost piece to the equation to a few of these, I would say we wouldn't want to price all of them out, but if you guys can narrow things down a little bit more, maybe one per site, we could, we can mm. work with my cost estimator to put, pull some data and right. say, all right, each one of these is going to project cost, which we we wouldn't want to say construction cost only. We'd want to put project cost because that's what you were saying, Joyce, about purchasing mm. the yeah. Sunderland site. Like that's going to be part of the project cost. It's not going to be the renovation cost. That's the hard cost. Right. But we'll break it all down for you and say, all right, project cost all in. What does it cost for each of the options that we picked for these sites? Add that to the equation and start to say, all right, can we now narrow things down into two based on how these things are comparing? Would that make it a little bit easier for the group to? I think, I think so. that might be that might be helpful because I, okay. I mean, we think renovating uh, an old building and renovating a new building like in Waitley and renovating, I guess that's also a relatively new building, but a different kind of building in Sunderland. I imagine right. per square foot renovation cost is different. In those cases, though, I can imagine the two new buildings being more similar. The the old, but that's the thing I'm in some ways that I, I in the back of my mind I'm worried about. There's lots of things I like about the location, especially of the right. South Deerfield site. Um, but um, and and I'm not even that wor much worried about the parking because there are just lots of mul there's multiple options there, uh, and there's there's uh, you know and and if you walk just a little bit further. Um, <laughs> up the street, if we expand that radius uh, just a little bit um, between all the entities there that are sharing parking. I, I think that I'm less worried about the parking, but the thing I sure. am more worried about is the uh, ability to renovate that old building and the cost involved there being probably, uh, I, I, to me, that's, it's like, oh, that could be like a million billion dollars, right? You sort of feel like, and, and I don't, and it's not based on data though. And maybe you have some a little bit more. Um, while it's still high level, um, you've got data on renovating old buildings versus renovating relatively new buildings that might help um, understand. Because right now, if I look at like Sandy Lane and Deerfield, which are kind of more centrally located, um, I you know. If it's just square feet, you're building similar amount of extra square feet. Um, and it just seems like I'm not sure I could decide on, like, are those costs really the same? And maybe you can have a little more nuanced um, input sure. on it. Does that make yeah. sense? I would tend to like to see, too, like, um, okay, it costs this much to renovate that building in South Deerfield versus the cost to take it down and put something new up. Mm -hmm. you know how, how dramatically different that is because i know people mm -hmm. are attached to that building i'm i just don't think structurally it's sound enough to do a second floor in there a lot like a, a, a metal building i just you yeah. know, i know we're fixing some of the rafters right now but i everyone wants to hang on to it but hang on to it for what an empty space i mean what are you going to do with it so yeah. i just structurally engineer wise I need to get people to understand what's truly feasible. Sure, you can renovate it and fit 10 people in because the floor is really rough and you can't just support the floor. I just concrete information on why that building must stand or must go is really important to this whole aspect of what we can mm -hmm. do there. Like yeah. the past. And, uh, you know, I, I agree completely, to... Trevor, that I think in order to, I mean, because that is not going to work unless the people in Deerfield are behind it. And that's right. not going to happen unless people have uh, um, good information. And it might be that under no conditions do people ever want to tear down that church. If yeah. that's the case, right. then our options it's, it's are. Right. Exactly. Right. They, that would, I mean, and, and um, so I guess right now what I'm hearing from you is it's not necessarily the case that 
under no condition will that church come down. I mean, in spite of the fact, I know you've put money into it for the restrooms and the various other things that you've done. And it may be that people don't want to waste that. Right. Right. Um, but uh, so so I was kind of thinking it'd be really hard to get people behind tearing down that building. Unless we have good figures, you know, we, we just need <laughs> realistic understanding of what's possible, what's not possible. And then sure. what are you going to do with the building? Okay. We have two well, now. That's going to be hard. <laughs> it's gonna be, okay. I mean, even if the numbers come out, I think that's going to be, that's going to be hard. But it could be. Yep. I appreciate the job you have in front of you there. Is all I'm yeah. saying. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta, we gotta figure out how to tackle that, tackle that one because there's a lot of, like you said, there's a lot of nuance to that, that option. Yeah, specifically. But I think if you know people understand, I mean, the big sentiment that I'm hearing is people want a permanent home for the senior center. A lot of people feel that the seniors have been left behind for a very long time. The seniors are starting to get really empty and restless. Um, a lot of people uh, are very disappointed in Deerfield for moving forward with the 1888 project, um, you know, in place of doing something for the seniors. And I think, um, you know, that's going to be something to overcome as well. In, in, in looking at all of those options. So, um, but as you can see, like we don't have a private meeting area, we're getting ready for a movie. So we've got lots of people moving in and out here. Um, you know, so having, having different spaces uh, would definitely be helpful for everything. I'll just um, play the pitch forks and torches if you want. Uh, oh, you yeah. know? Know? <laughs> know? Great. I've had the seniors, um, you know, actually talk about picnic and other things, and I encourage them to do what they want with their way out of the reaching out. I don't really think, you know, their their select point numbers, their annuity numbers, because um, you know, they. I've had study opportunities in my desk and uh, you know, other other community members have shared a family forty years for a center that actually did not. Uh, you know, that's functional people and things like How that. How are you today? So just want to share that. Nice and warm. Looks yeah. like we're going to get ready to watch a movie, apparently. Yeah. So we want to continue yeah, and do that. Right. Otherwise, we're going to stay in the house. No, you can do that. No, you can do that. So, um, I'm going to do that. It's okay. Sit wherever you like. Sorry, just be careful of the cord. Do you... Do you do you all do you all think that it comes down to the Deerfield site, whether you renovate or new? Like that's one option, and it's Sunderland versus Waitley for kind of the two slots. Does that does it seem like maybe that's a, huh. that's a battle right it, now? It's not I... to me. It's not obvious. Um, no, no, no. I, yeah, I, I, I get that, you. But like, if we're talking about battling for certain spots, like the, the, the small, the small option would be Waitley versus Sunderland, right? Versus the Deerfield option, which it seems like everybody wants to be in Deerfield. Like that's the central location. Like, so how can we make that site work? Whether it's a new building or a renovated building, yeah. like it seems like I, that purely I, because of the location. It sounds I, like I, go in that direction. Is that? I think not... only. I mean, I think it to me. There's a lot of big question marks on cost in Deerfield, and I think the there's places with new construction might both be better options than trying to rebuild um, on old construction. So I don't know if your little cost estimator, how much time that takes a person to do. Um, but it sounds like Trevor would like to know uh, tear down and rebuild project, just add on project. And then for Waitley, I think we could probably kind of choose among the ones you presented here and come up with one of the either uh, I'm I'm thinking do the larger square footage ones. I don't know if I would do uh, or maybe it wouldn't matter for the big picture. Uh, adding on a thousand square foot in either of those configurations. Um, if we had like a big picture, um, you know, it, it'll be a relative cost, right? Yeah. And um, for uh, Plum Tree Road, I would almost, I mean, maybe to make it completely 
equivalent, we'd want to say, do the one with the 15,000 square foot. It doesn't commit us to build that, right? Um, but uh, if we did that, uh, if we did those four and got like your big ballpark cost, I mean, if it turns out that, that um, you know, building on the new is that much cheaper, then maybe we go into more detail on the two that are new. If it turns out that one of those options in Deerfield is going to be more cost competitive, maybe because of the location, we would do that. But to me, it's it's not obvious where, say, those four options that I just mentioned, you know, where they're going to rank, you know, some of them could be double the cost of others. Well, and, I, think that's a, I think that's a good point. Maybe we, for this exercise, it's just apples to apples. So we pick the 15,000 square foot option across the board. Yeah. Just to say what is, you know, so that we're not comparing apples to oranges. And then to your yeah. point, that helps understand the comparison from one to the other. And then we can say, all right, we're not going to do the 15,000 square foot option at Sunderland. You know, what is that? You know, we're going to, we're going to go yeah. down that road, but we're not going to do the 15. We're going to do the 12 or whatever it is. Like we can start to hone in on which option yeah. we're going to go with. The, the other thing I just want to mention briefly about location, um, the Waitley space is not far from the North Main Street space. Yeah, so they're very close. They're both very and, central. You yeah. know, the, the Plum Tree Road one is further away. So if, if central location is a big concern, I think, you know, definitely doing the comparison between the new build with Waitley uh, and with the uh, South Tier build. I, I want to second that too. I feel like we should be setting what our priorities for success are and location is going to be a prime indicator of the success of a new senior center. And unfortunately, if that Sunderland lot were located anywhere else, regardless of the non-conformance, it would be great, but it is not located in a prime location for the three communities or the residents of the three communities. And I feel like if we are to reduce a site, it would be removing Sunderland from the option. Yeah, I guess because we, in, in our minds, we're, we have that other central location as a really important sure. thing besides the two that you're concentrating on. Well, and that's important for us to hear. You know, we haven't really spent too much time talking about the location standpoint, besides what, what Pete just said, which is his opinion, Sunderland is not really an option. So, I mean, does anybody else feel like that sort of not disqualifies it, but it puts it lower on the priority list purely because of the location? Oh, I think. But so it, but if it, oh, go ahead. Sorry, if it were to come in at like, like 50% of the cost of anything else, then yeah, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, uh, and it seems like, well, there's not, I think the Sunderland uh, Board of Oversight members not here. And I sort of feel like, oh, it's like just like when you're at committee meetings and you volunteer the people who weren't there yeah. to go do stuff. Well, this is sort of the opposite. We're, we're volunteering to to drop that site off. I, I sort of, you know, I, I, I feel like if it's not difficult to get that kind of ballpark cost, then it's probably worth getting on that apples to apples comparison. Sure. But I, I think I, I I agree with what Pete just expressed. And a lot of other people have, a lot of seniors have expressed that as well. I think the pure like renovation square foot costs, addition square foot costs, that's fairly simple. I think what Trevor was looking for, which was the, the structural integrity question at the church yeah. is a little bit trickier. So we're going to yeah. have to be creative in terms of mm -hmm. how do we, Again, without designing this, this right. stuff, it's really hard to, to say what are we doing. But I say be right. conservative then. Sure, and that's right. what that's what that's what I'm thinking is, is yeah. we'll make a lot of assumptions, which I hate doing, but I think at this point that's all we can do: make an educated guess as to what we would need to do, and we'll you know put some safety factors on there. We'll be conservative and say, all right, this is kind of what this is what we're thinking needs to happen um, without the without the knowledge of what exactly we'd be required to do, which makes me a little bit nervous. But I think for, for this, for this exercise, I think as long as everybody understands that it's just an exercise in comparison that, yeah. that we're fine with not having the detail because there's no way to do it at this point. Right. Are you also going to include the soft cost uh, based on the square footage? I'm sorry. The soft costs ballpark for the um, interior, all of that stuff. 
Yeah, typically we apply, you know, percentage percentages, industry standard percentages to construction costs. You know, it's a pretty safe bet at this point to include contingencies and, you know, if there's furniture costs and design costs and like there's other pieces of a total project that we would want to throw in there. So we'll, right. that will be in there as well. And it might, the percentage might change from site to site because Sunderland's going to be a little bit higher because you need to purchase the property, but we will have that in there as well. And we'll do our best to you know, hone in as much as possible specifically for each site so that there, it's not just a percentage across the board. It, it's, there's specific site factors, you know, built into those soft costs. Great. Well, since um, I'm not as attractive or talented as Annette Benning, I'll make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I will second that motion. Uh, so our um, official meeting is over. What's our, um, so Chris, you have a good idea of what we want to hear back and that might come in an email. Yeah. If, if you guys are okay with it, if I could maybe share the information as soon as I get it. And then um, I don't know if, if you think it'd be simple enough to take the numbers, I'll put an explanation to it, but I'll send you yeah. the numbers. You take all the information we presented today and yeah. If you want to get together as a group with us to talk about it, that's fine. If you guys want to talk kind of, you know, amongst yourselves, that would be fine okay. too. How do Our, you, um, how do you Board of Oversight is going to meet this Saturday. Is there any chance of getting numbers by Saturday? You could probably whip something up by then. Okay. Great. So I could share, I'll share that if you guys have your Board of Oversight discussion and then maybe just let us know if you want to have a follow-up meeting or if you want to just email me with your decisions or however you guys want to move forward with us, you let us know and we'll you know, we'll handle it any way you guys want. Good. Yeah, and for anybody watching, it's 10 a.m. on Saturday at the 22 Amherst Road site, and we'll also have the um, hybrid option, which is on the agenda. And one more thing to mention before we all disband, um, Jennifer and I and another colleague of mine have a public outreach event scheduled for, I believe, two weeks from today. Um, October 2nd. Yeah, yeah, we've been advertising um, in Perfect. the newsletter. We've been handing out flyers, and uh, the, the reporter is going to be doing an article for us right. to get more publicity. So, we're so we got we got a we got a survey. We'll be there for a few hours just to ask, answer any questions from people, and we also have a focus group that Jennifer and I have to plan a little bit further. But there'll be a few, you know, specific people that we'll sit down with and go through some exercise and do some fun activity. So it'll be a fun day. Great. Great. Alrighty. Thank, Thank you, you all. so much. Hey, thanks, thanks everybody. everybody. Appreciate Thank the feedback. You.